and everybody's familiar pretty much with the historical run that goes into making the first part of this diagram and, and the various RCP scenario runs that show projections into the future. Um, but what, what else is there in CMIP and, and what, what can be done with it? So I'm going to tell you about all of the experiments in CMIP, but first start with a little bit of an overview of the organization, just to give you some background. Uh, <clears throat> then talk about the three groups of experiments, so-called long-term, traditional, uh, uninitialized experiments, then the decadal prediction experiments that luckily Jerry gave you a good flavor for, because I'm, I'm kind of skimping on what I say about them here. The atmospheric only experiments, uh, <clears throat> and then at the end I want to go through some helpful resources that will, because I'm not going to be able to cover everything you're going to need to know. And I know you've, some of you in this room have already looked at this, and so I apologize for some of the redundancy, but remember that CMIP basically is organized as a grassroots uh, collaborative effort among the modeling centers. And they, the modeling centers basically said, we need a group to represent us so we can have the collaborations more easily. And they formed this so-called working group on coupled modeling, uh, which oversees all of CMIP. PCMDI has been assisted pretty much WGCM. PCMDI is the group I come from at Lawrence Livermore Lab. Um, and we, we, we sort of assist in managing and, and uh, coordinating the, the, the whole thing. But under, above this grassroots effort is an umbrella of an internationally coordinated research program. And don't worry about the details, but just notice that right above the WGCM is the so-called World Climate Research Program. That's, that's the thing that uh, actually appoints the WGCM, and uh, all of this work then is done under its umbrella. Well, there's even a little bit more to this diagram in that, you know, there's the IPCC that comes in, and, uh, <clears throat> and there's the climate research community, which is far right lower corner there, which is what I think most of the people in this room would be considered part of. And the whole point of all of this stuff is to deliver output to the climate research community so that they can analyze, produce new information about climate, climate change. And some of that certainly will feed into, well, has fed into past, will feed into future IPCC assessment reports. Again, to give you a scope, uh, sort of a measure of the scope of this effort, there's 29 modeling groups around the world who are involved in CMIP-5. They're not up quite all listed here. This, the updated list is at the URL at the bottom. Uh, 63 models in the end uh, participated. So it's a huge effort, of course, representation from many countries around the world, and a few more are being added for, for CMIP-6. CMIP-5, of course, wasn't the first phase. Um, it was built on uh, earlier phases, but was much more ambitious than its predecessors. And, and it was more ambitious in trying to address a wider variety of research questions. Uh, it included more comprehensive models, notably coupled carbon climate models for the first time. It produced more output fields for, for analysis. It called for more complete documentation of the models. Um, wasn't totally successful in that regard, but we're working uh, toward doing better in CMIP-6. It required a new delivery system for the data. Um, what NCAR is trying to help, help you get around is that the, the data is located in nodes, uh, repositories around the world that are linked together through something called the Earth System Grid Federation. And, and that has improved. The workability of that system has improved dramatically over the last few years, but um, as uh, Jean-Francois said, you can't, I mean, it's not maybe that productive for everybody to download all the data they need. So for certain types of projects that are really data intensive, it would make sense to have a central location with also computing facilities so you don't have to move the data around. Um, the, the CMIP-5 suite of experiments meets, was designed to meet the needs of the climate research community in general, um, and it ended up also providing, of course, a basis for many of the papers of interest to the IPCC. But it's important to note that CMIP-5 was not founded to serve the IPCC. It was founded to meet the modeling center's needs 
and and their 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 kind of desire to understand climate better, um, they've phased the, the the MIPS the CMIP project so that it kind of meets some of the IPC deadlines. Um, so it has certainly been affected by IPC in, in very important ways, but I think it would exist without the IPCC. So as I say, it serves many purposes. Um, about the only overriding or kind of overarching theme is that it tries to address the question, how reliable are climate projections on decadal and longer timescales? Or you could say, how uncertain are climate projections on those timescales? Um, uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, trying to understand climate, the way that the climate system works, uh, our major purpose, or at least a really strong motivation for such things besides our own curiosity, is it has huge implications for planning uh, by governments around the world. And one of the most important things to know is how much uncertainty is the, there in the projections. The multi-model uh, ensemble provides some perspective on that, although it has strong limitations, which I'll talk about. Um, OK, so what's, what's the problem with how to, how, why is it difficult to do this? Um, certainly, weather prediction has no problem in trying to assess skill and, and reliability because there's lots of realizations. Every day we do weather predictions, and we can evaluate how good they were. But climate, on longer time scales at least, we have essentially one well-observed period. And so it's, it's, it's harder to assess the skill with one, one single realization. But we do attempt to build confidence in the models um, by seeing how well their physics can represent various aspects of the system. And I listed some here. Their ability to uh, simulate important climate um, phenomena, such as ENSO, AMO, and, and uh, IPO, for example. Their ability to represent individual processes, uh, clouds, for example, important there. Their ability to, and we do tax them by trying to, in some models being run to, in weather forecast mode, and lots of models on uh, these decadal prediction, we can evaluate their skill on those time scales. And then their ability to simulate uh, paleoclimates, which is kind of a whole different set of boundary conditions, and see if they reproduce something that looks realistic. Of course, there's strong data limitations on those, uh, our ability to evaluate the models on those time scales. But even you know, if we build confidence by seeing they can they this uh, seeing how well they can simulate a wide variety of phenomena. Um, we don't know if those are the phenomena that actually allow us to predict, uh, make accurate predictions of the, the future. So we're always going to have some uncertainty there. Um, Jerry mentioned this idea of emergent constraints. That's one way that where, where there's physical relationships on short and long time, time scales, and we can evaluate them on the short time scales, and then uh, sort of extrapolate how they would, how, how they're, those, the impact of those processes on long scales. That, that's one, one uh, approach, of course. Here's the organization of the, the simulations. There's really th three types of simulations performed. The decadal climate prediction runs that Jerry um, introduced to you. There's the long-term projections. These are initialized from a, a control run, typically. It's in quasi-equilibrium. And then there's the atmosphere-only simulations, AMIP-style simulations, but also simulations with idealized prescribed changes in sea surface temperature. So I'll talk about each of these, and I'll spend most of my time on the long term, which has actually gotten, uh, I think, most analysis has been done on it at this point, not to belittle or, or minimize the importance of the other segments. The Again, to give you an idea of the scope, these are the number of years simulated per modeling group um, showing that uh, the majority of the years simulated were uh, to meet the needs of the long-term simulations, but decadal was not insignificant. The, I don't even put the, uh, the AMIP-style simulations. Those are very short, typically, so they're a small component here. So these are the different models along, or the modeling groups. Some of these modeling groups had several models. So for example, NASA GIFs had several models. Um, together, they, they give that peak there of a number of years. But it's over a quarter of a million years of simulated output that's available, simulated data that's uh, available for analysis. And again, just 
uh, to show you the division between the decadal, the long term, and the total. These are the typical number of years simulated uh, by groups who, who chose to, to perform the, the different uh, suites of experiments. Now, turning to the long term experiments, um, again, there's a, a rich set of experiments here. Uh, they're portrayed on this diagram with very short acronyms. Some of you will recognize some of them. Uh, in, in the quadrant over here, there's a control run. That's pre-pre-industrial control. There's an AMIP run. This is a historical run, abbreviated 20C. Um, but you can sort of, and then there's a whole bunch more. But the, I'll go through these in some detail just to give you an overview. But the, uh, the three segments I've divided into is these sort of idealized runs at the base, which really are help us to understand how the climate system works. There are s simulations that are very helpful, in especially helpful in evaluating models. These groups are not exclusive. They all contribute to, the, to, to each other, of course. But um, So that's in the upper left hand. And then the climate projection runs in the right, which is uh, exploring different scenarios into the future. So let me start with the, oh, and I, just to give you again a matter of perspective, the red the experiments in red had counterparts in CMIP3. All the other ones were new to CMIP5. And those in green are the ones that were performed uh, if you had a coupled carbon climate model. They're arranged into these tiers. The inner tier are, are the highest priority, and then the, the outer tiers are lower priority. Modeling groups tended to, well, most of the modeling groups who wanted to do this suite of experiments did most of the ones in the middle and fewer of the ones on the outer rings. So here's a, an example of one of the idealized experiments, um, the abrupt four times CO2 simulation, which I highlighted in red down there. And, and then there's an ensemble of runs at a lower priority to, 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 to pin down the noise and, ice, and better uh, estimate the forcing in these runs. So these runs are spawned from the quasi-equilibrium uh, control run with one time CO2, pre-industrial levels of CO2. And then suddenly, the model f sees four times that level of CO2. And that's held constant subsequently for uh, at least 150 years. Um, <clears throat> so these, these were run. And they were primarily motivated by uh, a study done by Jonathan Gregory, who showed that if you plot the response in, in such a simulation to the quadrupling of CO2 over time, uh, and you just plot uh, each, each of these represents one year of data going forward in time. Uh, and on this axis is the surface temperature change. So the surface temperature change initially is 0. And then as time goes on, you converge on a point, which would be the equilibrium temperature change for quadrupling of CO2. On the other axis is the imbalance of radiation at the top of the atmosphere. Now, in a control run, the imbalance is essentially 0. And then suddenly, when, when you quadruple the CO2, you start trapping radiation. And there is a big imbalance uh, in this particular model, 7 watts per meter squared. Um, and the, the fact that these points lie more or less on a straight line tells you that feedbacks in the model are more or less proportional to the temperature change, global temperature change. Uh, so the slope is a measure of the feedback parameter. Um, and from a plot, from doing this experiment, you can see how strong the feedbacks are in the model. You can estimate the forcing of the model, and you can estimate the equilibrium temperature change. So this is a basic characteristic of models. And it, uh, it carries over to other experiments. If you have a different forcing agent, this is a good estimator of how it would respond to a different forcing, say, solar forcing or something. Um, and uh, it's not a perfect estimator, but it's a good estimator. And uh, so this is a valuable piece of information to about know about models, because as you know, the projections, as I showed in that first slide, have a range of responses going into the future. Part of that range of response is because they have different climate sensitivities. 
And this shows you applying that methodology then to the CMIP-5 models. Tim Andrews uh, led a study on this. Um, and plot the, the feedback parameter. That was the slope of the line for each of the models against the equilibrium climate sensitivity, the final temperature at quadrupling of CO2. Or I think we maybe scaled it to doubling CO2 here. I can't remember. Um, the, uh, the fact that the points scatter around a, a line there indicates, and that that scatter is not too big, indicates that the strength of the feedback is the primary reason why the equilibrium temperature differences in models are, are why they're different, um, as opposed to uh, the forcing differences. The instantaneous effect of quadrupling CO2 in a model varies from one model to another. That gives rise to the scatter about, about this point. So this is a very important experiment, and uh, most of the modeling, many modeling groups did this experiment. We learned quite a bit from it. I'll go quickly through some of the other ones here. There's a fixed SST experiment that allows us to use another method to estimate what the CO2 forcing is. The value of that is that you can also, in that second rung, estimate the aerosol forcing. Uh, and that's one of the things where models differ quite a bit uh, from one model to, a ne to the next, even during the historical period. Um, there's the 1% idealized CO2 increase. This is a, a run where you start out at pre-industrial levels and then increase CO2 at 1% per year. This is a traditional run done in as ba far back as CMIP uh, 1 or 2? Two? 2. Anyway, or one of the two earliest phases. And, um, and so uh, this, this is being carried through. And it, it gives you a, it's a more realistic imposition of CO2 change than this abrupt four times CO2. And yet it's simpler than some of the scenario runs that, uh, that are in the RCPs. Um, it also allows you to, uh, well, OK, for, yeah, it also allows you to, to, to look at the uh, carbon cycle feedbacks by doing these uh, runs in the outer tier there. So you can estimate the strength of carbon cycles feedback by, d by doing a uh, study where you let the radiation codes see the increase in CO2, but not, for example, the vegetation and vice versa. Um, the other set of experiments are sort of coordinated by the CFMIP project, um, Cloud Feedback Model Inner Comparison Project. Um, and they're often idealized experiments where they're trying to get at, well, how strong is the cloud feedback and why does it differ from one model to another? The most, uh, there's been studies that show that cloud feedback differences in models are responsible for, largely for the, lar for the differences in overall sensitivity. So pinning down cloud feedback is important. These experiments help us to understand that. This is just one example, uh, the one my colleagues, Mark Zelinka, led. Um, uh, where he was looking not only in the CMIP-5 models, but in the predecessor CMIP-3 models at cloud feedbacks uh, using the cloud simulator package, which tells us a lot more. This is a special code embedded in the model when it runs and gives us more information, allows us to, to better uh, uh, compare the models to, for example, the ESCIP, uh, uh, the ESCIP observations of clouds. Anyway, this, this, this is to try and pin down the contributions to cloud feedback from total cloud amount changes, altitude changes, and optical depth. Moving over to the next quadrant, um, the, there are the, P, the uh, PMIP runs. Box in the right shape. But anyway, the PMIP runs, which are these paleoclimate model intercomparison runs. There's a mid Holocene run, which is a simulation of about 6,000 years ago when the uh, orbital configuration was different, so a different uh, eccentricity of the orbit, a different um, uh, time of, of, well, the precession had caused equinox to occur at a different time in the orbit and also a slightly different obliquity. Um, so that's kind of a Milankovitch uh, study of how climate can be affected. There's the last glacial maximum experiment with large ice sheets imposed on the models, and the last millennium, which is a thousand-year simulation uh, <clears throat> with 
things like solar forcing and volcanic forcing for a thousand year period. Um, that's not available. The control runs have no changes in forcing and the historical run starts in 1850. So this allows you to assess natural variability more uh, thoroughly looking at the last millennium. Um, there are runs for detection and attribution. So this is uh, trying to attempt to find out whether the simulate, I mean, the observation, observed changes we see um, are detectable against background noise and whether they, we can attribute them to specific causes like solar variability versus um, changes in, in CO2. And, and Jerry showed us some examples uh, from the IPCC indicating that in a lot of, in, in the recent period, um, you need the anthropogenic forcing to explain the changes that have occurred. And then there are the climate projections, uh, which are these RCP runs. Um, uh, these, these are carried out, I would say, primarily to serve things like the impacts community, community planners, people who want to look at some scenario that's not quite as idealized as a 1% per year run. And it gives them a range of scenarios, um, high emission scenarios, low emission scenarios, to, to explore the impacts of climate change into the future. So the long-term experiments, there are lots, lots of models participating. You can see on the order of, uh, well, in the case of the control and historical, 50 simulations in the RCP, almost as many. Some of the idealized runs, uh, special purpose runs, um, had fewer participating models. But um, in general, the ensemble was large enough that the multi-model um, multi ensemble perspective is provided across all these experiments. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be uh, looked at there. Now, as Jerry said, there are these, these uh, <coughs> other experiments where decadal prediction experiments which were initialized um, experiments, putting in uh, at least the near surface ocean temperatures, maybe the full ocean temperature distribution, and, and atmospheric conditions. And the whole idea here is, of course, that initially, if you were running a model uh, starting from a pre-industrial run, there's no way that the internal variability is going in the model is going to co coincide with the actual realization that has been observed. But if we initialize the model with the observations, this comes down, I mean, conceptually, this could come down to zero. And the internal variability error would be reduced considerably. And that could then feed into the reduction of the total error. Um, this shows you there are other contributions to errors, of course, going into the future. There's errors in not understanding what the forcing is going to be. Um, there's errors in model responses. Some models are too sensitive or too, or insensi or too insensitive. And those, along with internal variability, contribute to the total error. These, these are expressed as fractional uh, errors, I believe. No, no, no they're not. Uh, right, because the total isn't one. But um, so, so anyway, but the, the idea is, in the first 10 years or so, we should be able to have some predictability of the unforced variability component of the climate system. And so here's the suite of experiments that are performed around that basic idea. The central core experiments were these hindcasts and forecasts. Initially, they were going to be done every five years, and, and, event, and, then, out now, and then that was extended to basically every year starting in 1961, initialize the model. and. And, and, and watch it. There are some you know, other experiments. What happens if you knew ahead of time a volcano was going to go off? How would that affect uh, your prediction? Um, so if you look in the database, there, there are simulations with, they're called no valk and, and valk experiments, which are with and without, uh, or the other way around, without and with uh, volcanoes. Then the other set of experiments are these atmosphere-only experiments. Um, and we expected all the models to do these, at least some of these. The AMIP run, we hoped all models would do, and most of them did. Uh, so those are prescribed SST experiments. But there are some models, 12 in all, who uh, were unable to have a coupled 
atmosphere ocean model. They only had an atmosphere model. And so they could perform these experiments to evaluate the model, looking at AMIP and, and to understand it. And, and then a uh, future time slice where we prescribed SSTs based on, on future uh, conditions. I can't remember where the, those conditions came from, but um, uh, from a projection, a model projection. And then the models uh, could, could look at differences in, in those two. And this was meant for really targeted for very high resolution models, computationally demanding models, perhaps models that had a very uh, detailed treatment of uh, atmospheric chemistry that can't be run for hundreds of years. And yet we, can, we, we could uh, evaluate them and try to see what improving the physics of the model um, would do to, to the, its ability to simulate both present and future climate. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some resources then that, that you can use to, to, to do this. And I'm going to basically go to uh, a web page, which is where this stuff is found. So if you just search on CMIP5, um, you'll get to this. But on, that, on, on the uh, view graph, I have the web addresses. So you, you'll be able to, to see them if you can't find them anyway. So this, this is the entry page to the CMIP5 uh, <clears throat> that we host at PC, to the CMIP5 uh, project that we host at PCMDI. And um, I usually tell people to start at this guide to CMIP. And if you go there, it's, it's got kind of the, the most critical information you're going to need to understand these simulations and, uh, and analyze the results. So there's this information about the experiment design much more than I've given here. Um, some of it appears in, in, in this article in the bulletin. Um, there were preliminary, this, this article down here that Derry is the lead author on, um, and the, there was another one. Well, anyway, I think it was this one that uh, talked about this carbon cycle uh, approach to trying to diagnose the feedbacks, uh, well, as well as talking about decadal. Oh, no, this is the decadal prediction experiment. There's another article I don't see it here right now. And then, um, but this, this summary is another one. This is a web document. It has all of the experiment design. And usually, if you have a question about, you know, what, what were the modeling groups, you know, how did they actually uh, do some detail of the experiment? Did, um, what was included in the forcing, for example, or what was supposed to be included in the forcing? You can look in that uh, document, and it will tell you um, uh, at least what they were instructed to do. Not everybody followed the instructions, so you can't rely on it wholly. And I'll talk more about some of those problems after lunch today. Um, there are the experiment, the official experiment names. I'll just bring that up quickly if it comes up. Um, and oh, it won't come up. So, uh, it, but if you look in that, in that in this document, this will help you understand things like file names, which have embedded in each file name is the experiment name that was performed, and it's a very short acronym. Sometimes it's not obvious what it means, but this, this will give you the key to that. There's information about the forcing that goes into these runs. Uh, it's, it's really about concentrations and stuff. It doesn't tell you so much about how these forcings were arrived at, these concentrations were arrived at. But there, there's a lot of information in that section on there. There is output um, <clears throat> information about what the output is. and so this is a this is a actually the PDF version of a spreadsheet. You can get the spreadsheet itself. Um, the it, it's organized into tables. Each table has this is the table for the dimensions. It tells you what the output dimension name is. For example, in this column, um, all of the output requested. This thing I think is a couple hundred uh, pages long, so I won't go through it. But um, <laughs> It, it, this will tell you how the, the, the different variables are defined. It'll give you the variable names. It'll tell you what the sampling frequency is for the variables. So that's, that's useful to look at. There is inf information about 
the metadata requirements. So this will define what the global attributes that are stored in these files are all about. And I'll give you some examples of that this afternoon. Um, there's so-called data reference syntax. This helps you to understand how to interpret file names, for example, um, and directory structures. You should all go to this, which gives you, um, uh, well, asks ask you to acknowledge certain uh, people who made this, or you know, groups who've made uh, this stuff available. So I would in, invite you to take a look at that. Um, there are the official names of all the models. This is the thing I've pointed to before. So the modeling center, the the institute, a name. This is how it appears in in the. Uh, <clears throat> Well, this, this doesn't appear in the file names, but it's in the directory structure usually. And this is the then the model names over here. So there's all two pages of that. And let's see, model output archive. Go through that part because it's there is some model documentation. This this I noticed is broken but I can show you the, 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 the correct one. And then uh, there's additional kind of, the rest of the stuff, there's observational data sets that might be of interest to you. There's some links to other projects and so on. So this, this kind of gives you a really quick overview. And besides that, there's two other web pages I want to show you, which is an errata page. Um, these are things that have been reported as problems with files that have been found already. And if you have a particular interest in a variable, you should probably um, enter the variable name, like CO2 mass. If you entered that, you would find this entry. It's not a searchable database. It's you know you have to just do a search and using the, you know the utility of the, the search engine, but I mean of the uh, browser. But um, there's a, there's a lot of noted problems. A lot of sometimes the, on this column, it'll tell you what's done. For instance, IPSL has removed and replaced the erroneous files. So OK, you're OK there. Um, but sometimes the files are left in because there's an easy correction. And I'll give a couple examples this afternoon about how that's useful. But you should look at that. Um, if, if, it, it may save you some time uh, analyzing data that has actually flaws in it. And then finally, um, there's this publication page. If you click on this. Um, this gives you, uh, yeah, all of these seem of, we're still, it has two projects on it, but it's in a couple of weeks, it'll just say CMIP 5. Um, under this, you can look at, say, experiment, and you can arrange the experiments by count, and you can see how many papers registered in this database are based on the historical runs, 650, on the RCP 8.5 run, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and you see that you, you can see the popular runs up here for analysis. But for example, the abrupt four times CO2 has been uh, written about in 58 papers and, and so on. So this gives you an idea, you know, especially if you have a specific thing you're going to study with a particular experiment, you might want to browse some of these to find out what's been, been done before. Um, another view of interest is, well, variable. Let's see, I, I guess I could say, yeah, maybe frequency. That's what I wanted to show you, the frequency. If you look by frequency and then you <coughs> go by count, you can see that most output that's been looked at is monthly. There's some studies based on daily output, fewer on, on the six hourly, and then, for example, three hourly output that's available for a select set of fields has only been analyzed in 14 models. Now, this, this database is incomplete. We ask authors to enter their information here, but, and some of the entries are in, incorrect, too. But um, it, it will give you uh, an idea that I mean, the sub-hourly and three-hourly data may be ripe for looking at, but one of the problems with it is it takes forever to download it. So, uh, you know, probably, I mean, it'll be an interesting thing to decide 
uh, at NCAR whether they want to download the high frequency data because it's hard to do. On the other hand, if only one person looks at it and does a crummy study with it, maybe it's not worth it. So um, it's, it's, it's something you know, that has to be considered. So, so that gives you kind of a, a flavor of some of the things that are available online to help you um, in your analysis. And, and you really should spend a little bit of time at that website looking around before you write me with the question. Um, I get some questions that are just, you know, I, I don't mind if someone has spent an hour looking on the web for the answer and can't find it and then they ask me and I, but, you know, clearly they say, oh, where can I, where can I find information about CMIP5? You know, and I said, well, you know, you could use Google search and put in CMIP5 and you might find some. All right, so the, I have one more slide here. Um, so yeah, the, these, these are some of the links, but they're mostly available through that, that website. Um, I just want to say that I think CMIP5 provides results from an unprecedented uh, variety of climate models and experiments. So it's, it's really a huge resource. It required a huge amount of effort by the modeling groups uh, and others. Um, it, it's resulted in over 1,000 peer-reviewed publications. Yet only a tiny fraction of the information content really has been examined. So there's an awful lot of opportunity out there still. And of course, the challenge is to find, find the nuggets in all of that information, find something useful. So ask, ask interesting questions and then say, well, gee, is, is this something appropriate to, to, to try to answer with, the, with this, this archive? And maybe it's not. Maybe some of these other data sets that are available um, from NCAR and elsewhere would be better. Or maybe you have to design a new experiment. But, um, this is one place you can look. So thank you. <clears throat>